And we're back. This is Catfish on Ice, episode 136, our NHL draft special of 2022. We've got a really outstanding guest joining us. We're really honored to have this person join us from Dauber, Dauber Hockey. That is Alex McLean, who is associate editor for Dauber Hockey. How are you doing today, Alex? Doing well. Happy to be on. Should be a fun show. Yep. Uh, we are ready to bring you for you to bring us some knowledge today because um, there are so many good prospects out there, and Nashville Predators fans and our listeners really want to know what the Predators should do at the 17th pick. But before we do that, before we get all the way down the draft order when it comes to where the Preds are picking, really, really want to know uh, the top part of the draft class here is loaded with so many good players. Highlighted obviously by Shane Wright, and I, I just first of all I want to thank Dauber because they Dauber Hockey because they were really nice to send me a copy of their 2022 fantasy prospects report, which is I haven't been able to put it down. Like I've been so sucked into it. There's so much good information, over 200 pages of content that you need to go check out on Dauber Hockey right now. But um, I've been looking through all the prospects, and I want to I want to share what uh, what it says about Shane right here. That's really really interesting here. Likely a first line center who won't lead the league in points, but will do everything else, quote unquote, right. So uh, Alex, first of all, tell us about the top part of this draft class with Shane Wright and some of the other players. I know lately there's been talk of uh, Slavkovsky usurping uh, Shane Wright as the number one. There's a couple of people that think. Uh, Cooley's a bit of a dark horse to go number one and it really it's up to Montreal who they think the top guy is but uh, it, in my mind it's still Shane Wright he's the top guy in the class he has the highest ceiling he's able to do anything you need him to do he can be your number one center he can take defensive faceoffs, play on the power play the penalty kill and he's just such a smart player he can play with whoever he needs to as well whether you have a bubble hockey team whether you're trying to load up like Colorado he can play with skilled wingers he can play a bit more of a uh, down low grinded out game and he just has that ability to kind of change his game to thrive in whatever app whatever situation he's brought into and, and I think that's just impossible to pass up on as the uh, top guy he, he lost a big developmental year with the uh, COVID shutdown of the OHL. And, and I think that was partially why he didn't really show this year as well as we might have expected from somebody with exceptional status, from somebody who's expected to be the number one overall pick. And the potential is still there. I think he just might be a little step slower in actually reaching it than uh, some people might want to see. Interesting, yeah. And this draft class, I mean, compared to the last couple draft classes, it's 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 a lot more unpredictable. I don't know if you agree, Alex, but I mean, the suspense is going to be very interesting on Thursday just to see. You know, I've been looking through so many mock drafts, and I know they're just mock drafts, but um, I mean, it's all over the board. I mean, you see the same players in the top ten, but there's not really a consensus after Shane Wright as far as... You know, who's going to go number five? Who's going to go number four? Uh, so I want to get your – before we get to more uh, what the Preds are going to do, I want to get your mm -hmm. sense of how you feel about that, the unpredictability of this year's draft. Yeah, I, I'm with you on that, Chad. It's uh, it, it does feel like there's a bit of a tier with the top five, with uh, the three forwards that we mentioned, plus uh, the top two D-men in uh, Simon Nemec and uh, David Juracek. But after that, uh, we – yeah, we could see a forward, uh, whether it's uh, Gauthier or whether it's uh, Savoir or somebody sneak into the top five. But it does feel like those guys are the top five. And after that, it's wide open. I I've seen some people say, yeah, we might see uh, Savoir slip down. We might see another three defensemen go in the top ten. No one really knows what's going to happen. There's, there's yeah. just such a wide variety of opinions there's brad lambert that some people think oh he's not even second round guy and some wow. guys have him as the yeah. number three prospect in the draft so it, it's 
I, I think it's also due to that uh, same COVID shutdown. It really messed with a lot of development patterns. It messed with how people were able to scout these prospects. And it, it's really kind of diverged the opinions on a lot of players. So yeah. we, we could see a few unexpected guys slip down to the middle of the first round uh, that we think, oh, they're definitely going in the top 10. But th there's a lot of players that we could uh, end up seeing go and sneak into the top 10 as well. So somebody has to fall. Yeah, it makes it, entertainment-wise, it makes it for a really good uh, viewing pleasure-wise. For for the fan, it's going to be a really fun draft to watch for sure. That's um, cool. Yeah, right. All right, so let's get to um, the Preds now, the National Predators. Uh, they're picking at number 17. Um, if they stick around, because I do know there's plenty of teams who are going to be interested in possibly trading up uh, to get the player they want if they have a player they really like and they don't want to take a chance on not getting that certain player, they might want to trade up. I'll, I'm going to ask you another question about that, but first – I want to get to if the Preds do stick at the 17th pick, which is kind of no man's land. Like, you know, like a lot of people feel like you're too, you're not high enough to get a generational talent, but you're not that far back. You can still get a really good player. What what are like maybe two or three players that that if you were the Preds GM, you were like you would really be looking at realistically? Like, okay, I, we've got a good chance of taking this player. Yeah, and I, I think it's really tough, as we said, that, to even know who's going in the top 10. So who's going to be there sitting at 17? It it could be any of those. So yeah. I, I know I mentioned uh, there's a lot of differing opinions on Brad Lambert. He's probably somebody that they've done their research on because if he's still on the board, then he might be the highest upside guy there. Maybe you take a look at that because after Philip Forsberg, and we don't even know if he's sticking around, mm. We're, we're lacking in uh, a bit of dynamism on the uh, at the top of the lineup. So there, there's definitely something uh, to that. I, I think if you're sticking with forward, then we're probably seeing Jonathan uh, Lekerimaki oh. going before that pick. But oh. either of the other two uh, of his Swedish line mates, I, I'm a big fan of. So both Liam uh, Ogren and Noah Osland, I, I think okay. they're realistic targets. I think they're just as good and possibly better than uh, Lekiri Mackey, who's more of a shooter. Mm -hmm. And their game is likely going to translate very well to the NHL. They're both smart players. They can both play off the puck. They can both play well with the puck. They, they have skill with passing and they're they're just able to kind of take over a game in multiple ways so i i think those are a couple of forwards that uh we might be looking at uh, on defense uh just as one other option that i've looked at and i'm kind of hoping slips to the predators there is uh denton matejuk okay and i i've heard the occasional uh comparison to roman yossi and Ooh. wouldn't we all love that? Don't get Predators fans all... <laughs> you're going to get them all crazy right now with that. <laughs> yeah. But uh, he, he does play a bit of a similar style of game where he's just a bit of a rover with the puck. He's able to break He's able to break it out all by himself. He's a smart guy. He can play defense as he's uh, kind of returning from the offensive end. He's great with the puck on his stick. He's able to be deceptive and just kind of knows what to do to be able to make and open up lanes to make a play. So uh, he, he's somebody that I think uh, would do well uh, if the Predators were able to get him. I haven't heard that yet linked to the Predators, and I love it, though. I'm reading his scouting report right now from uh, Dauber, and it uh, just real quick, uh, a pure transitional ace, a good skater with exceptional puck skills and vision, especially on the rush. That sounds exactly like Roman Yossi. So, um, yeah, every Predators fan is going to say, where do I sign up for that one? Um, I will say, and I, I'm kind of on the same page as a lot of people, um, I'm not crazy about the Predators going defenseman. Obviously, if it's the best player on the board and it's a player you can't uh, deny, then mm -hmm. that's fine. But um, I really do want them to take advantage of all the uh, dynamic forwards and centers that are in this draft class in the first round. And I just feel like even if they stick at pick 17, there's going to be a really good 
player at forward or sure. center that has a lot of upside. I'm seeing a lot of players who have versi- versatility. They can play center or wing. And so uh, that has – that. That's. I feel like this team has to kind of turn the page on constantly swinging for the fences on defensemen, and they have to get faster. They have to start building speed in their prospect pool. And so uh, I really want to see them go forward or center, especially with this draft class. So I like a lot of the picks there you just said. Uh, I kind of want to ask you, Alex, again, we're being joined by Alex McLean of Associate Editor for Dauber Hockey. You need to go check out their 2022 Fantasy Prospects Report on on their website and go get that. It will give you all the information that you need on these prospects. It's really good content. We're really lucky to have Alex on tonight on Catfish on Ice, episode 136. All right, Alex, I want to ask you about the last couple of draft classes the Predators have had and just kind of how some of these prospects are doing. I really feel like the Preds have had really good draft classes in the last three years, particularly in the first round. Um, just mentioning some of the players I have. Uh, Iroslav Askarov, of course, their goal, goalie that's widely regarded as the top goalie prospect in the world right now. And then uh, Philip Tomasino got a lot of work this year in the league and, and really played well. You've got uh, Igor Afanasyev. You've got... Uh, You've got a lot of really good players in their prospect pool that um, Luke Evangelista had a great year. So I'm just really curious, do you think the Preds have had some pretty good uh, draft classes lately and just kind of how you feel about some of their current prospects that have already been drafted? Oh, 100%. I think they've, uh, I think they've been well above average uh, in the draft over the last few years. They had uh, Escaro drop into their laps at 11 uh, in 2020, and he was – at that point, by far the best guy on the board. I think that was, it, it was tough with having uh, UC Saros set up for the next number of years, having to take him at that spot, but he's yeah. just one of those guys that they couldn't let slip. And having too much of a good thing is still manageable because you can make trades, there can be injuries, and goalies do take a while to develop. So in another two, three, four, maybe five years once uh, Ascaro is ready to take over, then uh, who knows where we are with UC Saros at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, on defense, they're, they haven't used a lot of their uh, early picks on defense, and I think that's maybe why I'm a little bit more open to them using their first rounder on a defenseman this year. But uh, even with their uh, couple of mid-round picks, they've had a few guys who have jumped up and already look like uh, solid plays. Uh, Luke Prokop's doing really well. He had a great mm-hmm. run in the Memorial Cup uh, as well, scoring a bunch of goals, which kind of caught me off guard. But uh, he's yeah. more of a guy who's solid in his own end and showing a bit of that uh, offensive output as well is a nice thing to see as he's kind of coming up in the system. And another one on the back end who I'm a big fan of is uh, Ryan Ufko. I don't know if you've heard of uh, Scott Morrow. We're we're starting to hear his name around here in the prospect pool. Um, I don't know if you're, if you're, uh, we have uh, on the future, uh, which covers the Preds prospects around here. Mm -hmm. Um, They, 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 they're part of SB nation and they, um, uh, Eric is his, Eric Dene is his name. He runs on the future and he covers all the Preds prospects. He mm-hmm. does a really good job. He's been really high on Ufko and he's kind of like the next defenseman that's kind of in the pipeline right now that people are starting to get really excited about. Yeah, I, I'm on board with that for sure. I think, uh, I think he's actually going to be what people expected, uh, David Ference to be. I think uh, he, he's showing like he's one of the best uh, offensive defensemen in the NCAA right now. He's putting up uh, similar numbers to Scott Morrow and uh, Scott Perunovic, who are both uh, very highly regarded defensemen that are uh, making their way up as well. So I, I think he was a uh, steal in the fourth round. What about Luke Evangelista? That's what, I mean, the numbers yeah. he put, the numbers he put up last year was just like incredible stuff like video game type numbers mm-hmm. and uh i mean i know he's a couple years away from actually making the jump to the nhl but i mean 
because this 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 franchise, and I'm sure you you already kind of know this, but um, it's really painful for Predators fans like me who've followed the team basically since they were an expansion team. Um, we've always had a hard time developing homegrown, dynamic scoring mm-hmm. players. And we would look at a player like Luke Evangelista, who was taken in the second round in uh, 2020, I believe. And it's just, we, we can't wait to see him. And so for me, I want to keep building on that momentum and get another player like that this year in the first round. But you're really starting to change my mind on this whole defenseman thing you're talking about here. Because <laughs> you have a really valid point, Alex, about the fact that that well is starting to run dry a little bit in the prospect pool. So, you know, I'm thinking maybe they should go defenseman. It's going to be really interesting to see what the Preds do at the 17th pick. But I want to ask you one more thing. Do you think that a team like the Preds, it's maybe on the table that maybe they do draft up or trade up in the first round from the 17th pick? Do you think they're the type of team that could find benefit in that possibly? They, they really could, and if there's a, a guy that starts to slip down, as we were talking about, out of the uh, top 10 maybe, then they could move up to somewhere 10, 11, 12 and uh, be ready to jump on that. I, I think one thing to keep in mind, though, is they I, – I don't have the list in front of me, but I'm pretty sure they're missing their second rounder and maybe their third rounder this year, so there is a pretty big gap between their first they're, rounder and their next set of picks. They don't have a they don't have a second round pick. They mm-hmm. sent that for uh, they traded that to get Jeremy Lazan um, right. over right. over the season, but they do have two third round picks and they got a four they, they got an additional fourth round pick um, uh, by trading Matthew Olivier. So. Uh, just a couple weeks ago. So they right. do have a couple picks in rounds three and four. But, yeah, not having a second-round pick, that kind of hurts a little bit. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah. But uh, as we said, they have done pretty well in the middle rounds lately. So having that extra third, having that extra fourth, that does make a difference. And maybe that means they're a little bit more comfortable sitting where they are at 17 and just watching who drops. Mm-hmm. I, I think the tier there, if you're going to move up, I think you kind of do have to get one of your – top eight top ten guys otherwise the tier really starts to open up and you're yeah. best either dropping down a few slots or just sitting where you are at 17 because uh it, it really does drop down mm-hmm. and, and i think uh that was something they did really well with uh in, in 2020 as you mentioned with uh, luke evangelista he slipped to the second round and uh I, I know for my fantasy teams, he was somebody that I was uh, going to be targeting even before the draft, even before I saw he went to Nashville, and uh, he's done nothing but score goals since, and it's been yeah. really fun to watch. So, yeah, I, I'm with you on that. I'm excited for Evangelista. I think he's somebody that we can uh, expect to get a year or two in the AHL before he's really ready to make a contribution on the roster, but uh, he's not too far off at this point. And, yeah, he's going to make a, a good addition to that uh, top six on the wing. So, yeah, it, it's it's an option to stand pat for sure. In uh, 2021, though, they did make a couple of moves, and uh, they ended up having those uh, two first-round picks, the first one they used on uh, Svechkov and the second one on Lura. So... They do have a history there of uh, making a few moves, so it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't really surprise me uh, if David if, Boyle yeah had, uh, something up his sleeve to exactly to yeah that's happen. that's kind of that's kind of what I was alluding to. I mean, David Poyle's been doing this for a long time, almost as long as I've been on this earth. So um, twenty five years, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so it wouldn't surprise me either if he decides to um, pull something crazy off. Maybe he even uses that fourth round pick he got to uh, offer a trade package. I don't know. I I could see him maybe moving up if he has a certain prospect that he is just zeroed in on that he really wants. It's hard Mm -hmm. to say, but that's what makes the draft so fun. Okay, we've been joined by Alex McClain of Dauber Hockey, associate editor, covers all this stuff, gave us some great content tonight. Before we let you go, I just kind of want to ask you, I always like to ask all my guests this because it always fascinates me. I'm always interested to know. What got you into what you do? How did you get joined in with Dauber, which is such a great website. It's my go-to. I love it so much. The work y'all do is so amazing. How did you get associated with them? How did you get into uh, doing uh, scouting and looking at all this uh, stuff? Like, 
like just tell us about that yeah i i ended up uh in university taking up a lot of my spare time just watching hockey diving into numbers doing all of that and it got me into fantasy hockey and spending a lot of my extra time there so i i ended up uh I think at one point I was in about 12 or 14 fantasy leagues at the same time. Which oh, wow. A little insane. I, I'm <laughs> yeah. down to four at this point, which is a lot more manageable. But uh, I, I ended up actually joining the Dauber Hockey Forums. He has his own uh, fantasy hockey forum, and I was uh, a pretty active member there. And when they had a, an opening for the capped column, which was uh, kind of salary cap league focused, I tossed my name in the hat had never actually played in a salary cap hockey league at that point but said you know what sounds like fun Mm -hmm. got that uh position and said okay i need to join a salary cap league to be able to actually know what i'm talking about yeah and uh had two going at that point and started there worked on that for i think about four years i was putting out a weekly article there and then uh moved up when cam robinson uh left Dauber Hockey and uh, ended up taking over his slot. So, yeah, it, it's been a lot of fun uh, working with the team. It's a great spot, a lot of knowledgeable people, and yeah. especially on the Dauber Prospects side, uh, working with them, they they put in a ton of time just watching video and uh, getting everything ready that they do, keeping all the notes uh, intact. I, I don't know what I'd do without uh, that whole website. So yeah. I mean, it's I, I, I try to tell people who maybe don't watch hockey very closely, and I know we're probably biased because we're mm-hmm. hockey fans, but and I'm not taking anything away from the other major sports and the scouts that do that work either because they work hard as well. But with hockey, you've got so many international leagues and so many different leagues, and it's just the work that the scouts do uh, to put the content out there for people, ordinary people like me to uh, – take it in and read it and talk about it. It's just, it's amazing. So Alex, it's been so much fun having you join us tonight on Catfish on Ice to get us ready for the 2022 NHL draft, which is this Thursday, just two days away. Um, It's been a lot of fun. Thanks a lot, man. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Chad. It was a good chat. I enjoyed it. And go follow Alex at Alex D McLean on Twitter. To get all of his good stuff, go follow Dauber Hockey, Dauber Prospects, all that good stuff. You won't be mad that you did that. You should be already doing it by now if you're not already. But thanks, everybody. This is episode 136 of Catfish on Ice podcast, NHL Draft Special.